Well, good morning. Greetings to you all of you in the name of our Lord, and what a great day to be gathered together around God's Word. Got a few announcements for you real quick. Just a reminder, membership class is tonight, 7 o'clock, over at the Parsonage. And uh, if you can, those of you who are attending, if you can have those, uh, go through those questions and, and answer them before we get together, we'll have the most productive evening then. October Women's Ministries meeting has been canceled due to the retreat being the following weekend. So if you were uh, planning on a Women's Ministries meeting for October, you don't need to now. And so far as the rest of the week lays out, pretty usual. Again, we have Lutheran Brethren Youth Fellowship this afternoon at 3.30 with membership class at 7 tonight. Wednesday will be our usual Family Fellowship and Kids Bible Club. And next Sunday, we'll lay out just the same. I also want to go ahead and make the announcement that Larry Seibold's funeral has been scheduled for 1 o'clock on Thursday with a graveside service to follow and lunch following that. Any other announcements that need to get out there yet this morning? Excellent. Well, in that case, I'll encourage you to look with me to our call to worship for this morning, which comes from Psalm 104, verses 33 to, 30, to 35. Psalm 104, 33 to 35, you can read that right out of your bulletin or off the screen here, but let's read that out loud together. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That indeed looks forward to that time when Jesus returns, the world is created new, and righteousness reigns, where none of us will be afflicted by sin and its consequences anymore. And what a glorious day that will be. Let's now sing our praises to God. Hope so sure, a promise so secure, a mystery of God at last we know. Truth so fast appear, all wisdom, knowledge here is Christ in us, the hope of glory. And the life that I now live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me, the hope of glory. And each day I live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me the hope of glory. There is a life so true, a life of love so pure. For all our sin, a perfect sacrifice. And when that life was nailed on cruel cross and fell, our sinful flesh with him was crucified. And the life that I now live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me, the hope of glory. And each day I live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me, the hope of glory. There is a life so strong that a whole world of wrong and all the powers of hell could not defeat. For Jesus rose again and if we died with him, with him we'll rise to share his endless life. 
and the life that I now live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me, the hope of glory, and each day I live no longer is my own. Jesus lives in me, the hope of glory. Believe it or not, we had that slide problem in practice this morning, and we fixed it, and it came back. So, apologize. The whole service crashed, so it's probably locked. <laughs> but we did notice it was out of place. So, if you're wondering, did you just practice? Yes, and the slides were working when we said we're good. <laughs> Sorry, Emily. <laughs> Emily doesn't doesn't get stuck with that sometimes too. Everything else should be fine. That was the only one. <laughs> Joy of the Lord is our strength. We 
bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. Technology gremlins are working overtime today. I know that because I've also lost control of the projector from my end. All right, well, we get to move on now to our Old Testament reading, which today comes from Numbers chapter 11, verses 24 through 29. Numbers 11, 24 through 29. I'll give you a moment to... Interesting. Oh, I see. It went back to the, uh, the full thing. All right. Give me a second here. No. Let's see if that works. No internet. Wow, we. Well, let's just do this the old fashioned way then, huh? Numbers 11. I'm going to start reading verse 24 through verse 29. Wait a minute. We got it. We got it. Hot dog. <laughs> All right, so right before this, Moses had been approached by the people. They were been, they'd been complaining against the Lord and against Moses and uh, saying, why did we ever leave Egypt? All this kind of business. And uh, at this point, the Lord comes to him uh, and reminds Moses who he is. His power is limitless. And goes ahead and tells them to explain this to the congregation of Israel. So, and so beginning in verse 24, so Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Also he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, and he took of the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied. But they did not do it again. But two men had remained in the camp. The name of one was Eldad and the other Medad. And the spirit rested upon them. Now they were among those who had been registered but had not gone out to the tent. And they prophesied in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain them. 
But Moses said to them, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. This is the beginning of, of kind of our theme for today, which is the, the idea of who is the Lord's, who belongs to the Lord, and what it is that our own sinful nature can do in separating our, ourselves from God's family, right? Insulating ourselves a little too much from the rest of the church of Christ throughout the world. And uh, we see that, that this temptation goes all the way back to the, the beginning of Israel as there were people, people prophesying by the Lord who had not done what some of the other people in Israel thought they should have done. They should be at the, the tent of meeting if they're going to be prophesying. And yet the Lord uh, chose them to prophesy right where they were in the camp. And Moses gives them a good reminder, um, saying that it is wonderful that they are doing this, uh, prophesying in the name of the Lord where they are. Don't be jealous for my sake. It would be great if all the people were prophets of the Lord. And we will see that in our reading from the Gospels today as the disciples then encounter people who were doing work in the name of Christ, but that weren't part of their own little group. And Jesus is teaching for them as well. So with that, let's go to our first hymn this morning, hymn number 32 in the hymnals. Hymn number 32 is, O God, our help in ages past. Can you read that out of the hymnals or off the screen here? But why, please rise as we sing together. seated. It's at this time I get to invite up Joel Munson, who's going to be sharing a passage of scripture with us this morning. Good morning. I am going to read Psalm 2, and uh, if you want to follow along in your hymnals, that's page 552. I actually started with Psalm 1, um, but Psalm 1 has that, uh, that uh, thought of, um, it's one that's often used if, uh, if you forget. I hadn't forgotten, but I, 
I looked at Psalm 2 and I thought it actually fits pretty well um, with our where we sit today. Um, and it's one that we can take great comfort in. Um, I'll just read the last of the 12th verse to start. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. And that is something we can um, certainly be blessed by and take comfort in. Um, make sure your hope is in the Lord. Um, of, of note, verse 2 and verse 2 is, uh, is quoted in uh, Acts chapter 2 and is attributed to the acts of Herod and those who crucified our Lord. Um, uh, reading in Jesus' name, Psalm chapter 2. Why are the nations in an uproar and the people devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand. The rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. Now, therefore, O kings, show discernment. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he may not become angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in the Lord. Thank you, Joel. And what a, what a great reminder for all of us as we see the world around us doing the exact same thing, right? There's wars, there's fighting, there's disorder and chaos in the nations and, and even our, in our own. And yet in the midst of all of that, our king still reigns, right? He hasn't gone anywhere. None of this changes anything about who he is and what he has done for that, for us. None of that changes the eternal hope and promise that we have in his name. We are eternally secure in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, no matter what happens in this world around us. And praise be to God for that. Well, we go now to our next hymn this morning, which is hymn number 465. Hymn number 465 is my Savior, first of all. And once again, would you please rise as we sing together? <clears throat> Yeah. 
may be seated. We turn back to scripture with our epistle reading for today, which comes from James 5, verses 1 through 20. Again, I'll give you a moment to find that in your own Bibles if you're following along there. This is James 5, 1 through 20. James 5, 1 through 20, reading in Jesus' name. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted and their rust will be a witness against you and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields and which has been withheld by you cries out against you. And the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of, the, of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the righteous man. He does not resist you. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, so that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Is anyone among you suffering? Then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. Therefore, confess your sins to one another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. Then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain, and the earth produced its fruit. My brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James here gives us a picture of what it means to live as the body of Christ praying for one another, caring for one another, we're lifting each other up, even speaking those words of condemnation that start this passage out in the hopes that one would turn and be saved. Um, as we live in this little community of ours inside this, these walls, we do that. But we are also called to do the same in amongst the greater universal church of Christ in the world around us as well. And with that, let's now go to prayer as we heed the call from God to bring everything to prayer, in prayer to him. And so before we do that, I would ask if there are anybody who knows where my little pen went to. Hold on. All right. <laughs> I'll ask if there are any special prayer requests we can share together this morning. definitely keep sharing and the rest of Larry's family in our prayers this morning. Thank you. Wow. 
Incredible. Certainly. Oh, I can't even imagine. You bet. And what was her name? Alex. Alex. Alex Jane. Thank you. Praying for Alex and her little one and uh, the recovery that's forthcoming after this, this fire took her home. And yeah, wow. Home. Incredible. Wow. Well, praise God. She made it out and, and for the work of her neighbors, too. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Bible Translation Sunday, a day we get to remember and, and honor those who uh, do the, the difficult work of translating the Bible. There's still so many people groups in the world that don't have any of Scripture in their own language. And so that work continues. We'll be praying for them, praising God for the faithfulness of those translators who have worked in the past and given us the Bible in our own language and praying for their work going forward. Thank you. Say again. Today is, Day. Today is Daughter's Day as well. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, we'll definitely be uh, praying for our daughters and granddaughters. They are all precious to us and everyone who is a daughter or a granddaughter. We'll continue to pray for Angela, who is fighting cancer right now. Thank you. Well, if there are no others, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious and almighty Heavenly Father, you who are enthroned above the earth. Lord, we thank you and praise your name for who you are, who you've revealed yourself to be, and what you have done through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we thank you that by restoring us to yourself through him, you invite us to pray to you. We thank you that you hear these prayers and answer them. And so, Lord, we want to pray for Sharon and for the rest of the family now as they mourn Larry's passing. Lord, we pray that you would give them comfort during this time, give them your sympathy, and, uh, and, and fill their, their hearts and minds with blessed memories of him. Lord, we pray for Alex and her little one as they uh, narrowly escape this house fire. Lord, we uh, thank you for the heroic actions of her neighbors in waking her up and getting her out of there. And uh, Lord, we pray you be with her now and in the days and weeks, months and years forward. Um, help her to navigate all the issues surrounding insurance and everything involved there. Help her get back into a home again real soon. Lord, we thank you. For this reminder that it is Bible Translation Sunday, we thank you that uh, there have been so many working throughout the years and working today to get your holy word into the native language of so many peoples around the world. Lord, we know there's so much work to do, to do yet, and we do pray that you be with all of those translators as they seek to faithfully bring your word into another language. Lord, we thank you for the blessing of having Scripture in our own language, and we pray that for everyone the world over. Lord, we thank you 
That is also a day to remember our, remember our daughters and our granddaughters. We uh, thank you how, how precious they are to us. We thank you for giving them to us. And we pray that uh, we would guide them and care for them all throughout their lives. Be with them in all that they do. And, uh, and turn them all, turn all of their hearts to you, to see you as Savior and Lord. Lord, we continue to pray for Angela, who is fighting this cancer. We pray that you give her strength uh, to get through whatever treatments she is facing. Give her rest as she needs it. Lord, give the, the doctors skill in treating her and wisdom. And Lord, we just pray your incredible healing upon her. Lord God, we want to pray for those among us who have ongoing health struggles. We think of Harvey and Marilyn especially. We pray that you give each of them healing, give them comfort and relief from their symptoms. Lord, we uh, also pray for this country of ours, and especially for its leaders. Lord, we uh, know you have placed them over us for a reason, and we just pray that you would give them wisdom to rule rightly, to create and enforce laws that are just. Lord, we pray for all who are not with us today, whether it's those who are ill or, or those who are traveling. We pray that you bless them with health and safety and, and pray that you would bring them right back to us safe and sound. Lord, we do pray for our families. Uh, we first pray that uh, you would keep our families strong, faithful to you. But we also think of those families that are struggling, that are in crisis. Um, we pray that you'd give an extra special care to each of them and uh, give them grace and strength to face the difficulties they are facing. And Lord, we do pray for this church body. We especially pray that you would give us the determination to carry out this wonderful mission you have sent us on making disciples of all nations. Lord, we pray that you would give us confidence, give us drive to seek those out who do not yet know you as Lord and to bring your precious gospel to them. Lord, we pray that we would be, all be missionaries right in our own communities. Lord God, again, we thank you for this opportunity to pray together. We thank you for promising to hear and answer each one of these prayers. And we know that you are doing so according to your perfect will. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We go now to our next hymn, hymn number 515. Hymn number 515 is Rescue the Perishing. And again... Would you please rise as we lift up our voices in song? Great one. 
Please remain standing as we now go to our gospel reading, Mark 9, 38 through 50. Mark 9, 38 through 50. And once again, I'll give you a moment to find that in your own Bibles if you're following along there. Mark 9, 38 through 50, reading in Jesus' name. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to prevent him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not hinder him, for there is no one who will, who will perform a miracle in my name and soon afterward be able to speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because of your name as followers of Christ, truly I say to you, he will not lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe to stumble, it would be better for him if, with a heavy millstone hung around his neck, he had been cast into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than having your two hands to go into hell, into the unquenchable fire, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than having your two feet to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. If your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye having, than having two eyes to be cast into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good. But if the salt becomes unsalty, with what will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This ends the reading of God's word. You may be seated. So last week we were looking at the disciples and uh, they had a problem. They were arguing about who was going to be the greatest. And they were already, at that point, starting to kind of turn away from Christ and trying to set up a, a hierarchy among themselves. Pride and, and jealousy had become their focus and not the greatness of Christ. And because Jesus is so good at it, we saw him refocus their attention. and He gets them to stop looking at each other and look back to him as the one who is truly great. And right afterward, Jesus loses their attention again. And this time they're looking at someone who is driving out demons in Jesus' name. Pride and jealousy again become their focus, not the name of Christ. Now, we see John here, and he's bringing to Jesus a very valid concern. He saw a man driving out demons in the name of Jesus. And, and that there in itself is a pretty good thing. But the problem with this guy, according to John, is that he isn't one of the disciples. And what John is concerned about is that here we have a guy who is quite possibly misusing the name of Jesus, performing miracles and, and uh, doing them even though he's not one of the us, of the disciples. And so John and some others do what they think ought to be done. They're telling him to stop. And that makes sense. John is, is so zealous for Jesus 
that he does not want anyone to tarnish his name, to tarnish his reputation by using his name in the wrong way. It's not uncommon that someone would use a famous person's name for their own benefit, is it? This guy could have been a self-proclaimed sorcerer who was trying to give himself credence by using the name of Christ. Or he could have been a, a con artist trying to make a buck off of fake remedies. Who knows what this guy's up to? All John knows is he's not part of his group, and so John's going to tell him to stop. But there's a problem here. John, or Jesus doesn't tell John, good work, you've done a good thing preventing this man. Why not? Why, why does Jesus say the exact opposite? He says, don't stop him. Now, I'm sure John had to have been thinking that he was doing Jesus a great service, stopping this, this outsider from using his name. But the problem was that John didn't yet understand what makes someone part of his community. He didn't know what got you into the club. He didn't know what makes you an insider instead of an outsider. And John thought that this man had to be one of us, or, or our follower, as he says, in order to be a Christian. John was looking at this man, knowing that this guy didn't go out to all the same places as the other disciples, and maybe he didn't act the same way as the other disciples, or that he just didn't do things in the same way as the rest of the disciples. His clothes maybe were different. His accent was different. His education, his employment, his hobbies, his friends, temperament, habits, all different. And because he wasn't joining the crowd, John had to stop him from using the name of Christ while doing good works. But Jesus has something to, different to say about this man. First, that he cannot possibly be doing Jesus, miracles in Jesus' name and then later talk bad about him. And second, that he is not against them and is therefore for them. See, Jesus has to take John's idea of community, that is, his idea who is in and who is out, he has to take John's idea of community and transform it so it better aligns with Jesus' idea of community. But how is John supposed to know that this guy is okay? How is John supposed to know that he really is part of the crowd, even though he doesn't run with them? Well, the first thing we need to recognize is how the disciples were able to perform miracles in the first place. True miracles can only be done when it is Jesus' will that they be done. And the disciples always did their miracles in the name of Jesus. And so when Jesus is saying that no one can perform a miracle and then talk bad about me, what he's saying is, is that the man that John is so concerned about, he could not be doing these miracles in Jesus' name if Jesus doesn't already will that they happen. Then to add on to that, Jesus says that whoever is not against us is for us. And so Jesus is defining for John what the concept of us is. This man is pro-Jesus. He is an anti-Jesus. Now, to be cautious, it's important to remember that the key to being for Jesus is faith, right? But this man is performing miracles in Jesus' name, and no one can confess that Jesus is the Lord without faith and the accompanying Holy Spirit. And by virtue of that fact, Jesus knows that this man is one of his own. The idea that this man didn't go all the same places as the other disciples, that he didn't act the same way as the other disciples, or that he just didn't do things in the same way as the rest of the disciples, none of that makes him an outsider like John thought he was. He has faith. He is indwelled with the Holy Spirit. And so he is one of us. The idea that this man's clothes were different, his accent was different, his education, employment, hobbies, friends, whatever, doesn't matter. He is one of us. And so back to the idea of this community we have in Christ. When we form a community ourselves, it's usually on the basis of what John here thinks is community. We form community based on shared backgrounds, shared ethnicities sometimes, common goals, common language, on, on, and on. 
We form community based on something that is the same about us. And we identify some kind of trait that we all share, and we form a community based on that. If you have cons conservative political views, you'll join a community of Republicans. Liberal political views, join a community of Democrats. If your family is full-blooded Norwegian, you're probably going to spend a lot of time with Norwegians. Right? If you like the Vikings, I, well, I'm not going to go there. The <laughs> ring on the Vikings as much as I can. And this is exactly how a local congregation tends to form, right? It, just like here's today, ours today. But, but Christ here begins to show us that there is a much wider Christian community that exists beyond our small congregation. It's a community that is not based on whatever characters, characteristics we ourselves possess, but it is a community which is based solely on the characteristics of Christ and him as our object of faith. And so as we consider the kingdom of Christ that, that exists outside of our own walls, it is very important for us to realize what this kind of community looks like because there will always be the danger that we, like John, might interfere, might try to mess up, mess up that community. And so to talk about our Christian community, I want to talk about how our text today tells us that it is, it's a community of solidarity, it's a community of service, and it's a community of saints. Now, first of all, it's a, our Christian community is a community of solidarity because of who Christ is and what he has done. We have solidarity in that because he does not change. It isn't dependent on who we are, what we look like, what we do, how we operate. And that's why verses 38 to 40 tell us that there really is no us and them when it comes to worshiping and working in the name of Christ. And that's really easy to see when we look at our own congregation, you know, our own little group of disciples. But what our text today does is it challenges us to look at the Christians who are not part of our little group of disciples. You know, you plug in your phone, churches near me, and you're going to get a huge list of, of churches around us, right? Pretty much right in our own neighborhood. You get Grace Bible Church, New Covenant Baptist, First Church of Nazarene, Christ the Redeemer Anglican, right? Zion Lutheran. Do we have community with them? You bet we do. We do because wherever there is faith in Christ, there is community in Christ. But as I'm sure you're well aware, there are vast differences between us and them in, in how they do worship, the kind of music they sing, uh, so on and so on. And, and these differences make it so that we are not going to see, succeed in worshiping together week in and week out. The ways we worship, the kind of music, whether we use liturgy or not, the, the doctrines and the writings that we identify with, even the language that we speak in some cases is going to be different from one church to the next. These are divisions that do cause us to gather into our own congregations to worship on Sundays. But do these differences mean that we are not united in Christ? No. No, they don't. And our text this morning serves as a warning for us to not become like John. Now, there are going to be differences in some churches that do destroy unity. And this is where I have to be very careful and very clear that there does exist a them who are definitely not a part of us. There are some who claim the name of Christ who will, in the end, hear those terrible words, depart from me, you workers of evil. I never know you, knew you. There do exist out there unity-destroying differences, mainly those differences that deny Christ as he is revealed in Scripture, or differences that... Uh, because one denomination or another denies the truth of Scripture. I'm not, I'm not saying at all here that we have community with such churches or people. But those things aside, those things aside, we do have community with churches around us. So, for example, we're not to look at the Baptist church or the Anglican church and the way they do worship or the way they teach and begin to denounce them for not being just like us in the less important matters. 
we don't whisper among ourselves that church should be done in English instead of in Spanish, for example. We shouldn't look sideways at this preacher because he wears vestments or that preacher because he wears, I don't know, Bermuda shorts, right? But how easy is it to do exactly that? You know, we can let our sinful nature come out and say that we're the only ones with the exactly right doctrine, that we're the only ones who do worship in the right. I mean, I joke about that all the time. You know, Lutherans have got it all right. Got, got good doctrine. And I'll defend our doctrine to the death. But we can have differences. Differences on things that are clear and differences on things that are ultimately unemployment. But we can say that we're the only ones who do worship in the right way, for example. Or that we're the only ones who make proper use of our money or speak the right language. But if we do that, we have Christ in Scripture turning our heads back to him and telling us that there are differences that are irrelevant. Because it is proper faith in him that makes us a community of faith. There really is no us and them when it comes to true faith. And because we are a community of solidarity, we are also a community of service. Verses 41 to 48 in our text tell us that kindness and service are the hallmarks of Christian community. Look how small a thing it is when Jesus, that, that Jesus uses as an example here. If anyone gives you a cup of water in my name, right? Small thing, just a tiny act of kindness. Small as giving you a drink if you're thirsty. And that ensures their heavenly reward. Why? Well, certainly not because it's an act being done to earn salvation, but because just as performing a miracle in Christ's name cannot be done with the accompanying faith in Christ, a kindness extended toward you in the name of Christ cannot be done without the accompanying faith in Christ. So in that same way, we don't allow our differences to prevent us from showing kindness to another in the name of Christ. Those differences that I've already talked about that, that result in us forming different churches, they change nothing when it comes to rendering service in the name of Christ. You know, invited to help out at another church, invited to help out in a, in a uh, community project or some act of service, whatever it is, you can do that. And rejoice that we are all one in this community of faith. You know, how much better is it to, to rejoice in the ways and the works that another church is doing in the name of Christ than to denounce their appearances or practices? And finally, we are a community of saints. And just to be clear, when I use that word saint, I'm going to tell you how I'm using it. Because that, the English language gets funny around that word. This is not the Roman Catholic meaning of the word saint, okay? It, in that it's reserved for just those special people who have done extraordinary things in the name of Christ. And, and I also don't use the, the word saying that we always 100% act saintly. Like uh, everything we do is always good and we never sin. Now I'm using the word saint in its biblical sense. Which tells us that all who believe in Christ are called saints. We are all the people set apart for salvation and for entering into God's mission. And so by that definition, we are indeed a community of saints, a, a people saved by faith and set apart for the purpose of bringing others into that same saving faith. Verses 49 and 50 tell us all about the peace we are to have with each other as a community of saints. And this peace we are to have with each other is to be a foretaste, a little glimpse of the perfect kingdom, the perfect community that we will have as we enter into the eternal kingdom of God. You see, once again, we have that, that sinful nature in us that loves to war with each other over the little things, right? All those things that we've already talked about, worship style, music style, different teaching styles, right? We're tempted to war over those things and then tarnish the community of Christ. The very thing we 
that that very thing was talked about in our reading from James today. We can encourage factions and divisions among ourselves. Or we can argue with others and, and criticize their practices based on what's not important. But instead, we're called to let our common faith in Christ produce peace instead of war. All who believe have been predestined to join with him in that heavenly kingdom where all divisions will be healed. All languages and nationalities will be made one. All clarity in regards to Holy Scripture will be given. And we will never again have cause to worship apart from one another. And it's that perfect community of saints we look forward to. It's that that we, we are to keep in mind as we are encouraged to have peace within our imperfect community, community of saints here and now. We'll get there someday. And so why don't we live in anticipation of that day? Us saints who have been salted with fire, that, that baptism giving the Holy Spirit who preserves us and makes us unique and, and delicious to those around us. Don't deny the community we have with Jesus and then lose your saltiness. Instead, be that salt. Look like the kingdom that is to come. And show the world why it is that Scripture calls you a saint, even though you do remain a sinner at the same time. See, community in Christ really is extraordinary. It's a radical kind of community. It's completely different from the way the rest of the world operates. And so is that what the rest of the world, when it sees us Christians... Unfortunately, because it is easy and natural to live focused on who's in or out based on the unimportant things, it isn't always what the world sees. And because some do claim the name of Christ, but do not truly know him, the world doesn't always see unity either. But when we are faithful to Christ, and we live in peace in that community that he has established, despite our differences, that community really is something amazing. It really is something different from the rest of the world. And we have something so different, so unique and flavorful that the world gets a glimpse of it and hopefully desires to be a part of it. It's a community of solidarity, a community of service, a community of saints. What other, what other community can claim that? And it's all because of the common faith we have in the person and work of Jesus Christ. May God grant that we forever live in that community. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, you tell us that in Christ all are one, that there is no division. Those labels and... Uh, differences that we use to to sort ourselves out do not exist in your holy church and so lord i pray that you continue to encourage us to to live alongside and work alongside not just those in our own congregation but all of those who are called by your name lord help us be discerning discerning to know those who are not truly yours but uh let us be salt and light to the world around us by this. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, our last hymn this morning, quite appropriately, is Cups of Cold Water, hymn number 493. Hymn 493, and once again, would you please rise? as we sing together.
Now receive this benediction from 2 Peter 3.18. May you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And to him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.